Welcome to our webinar about how to deal with digital assets and the business realities versus the knowns and unknowns behind this technology. Uh, this event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce New York. My name is Yvonne Bendinger-Rothschild. I'm the executive director of the EACC and I will be your host and moderator for today's event. Our discussion will offer a comparative assessment of business implications that dis digital assets have in Europe and the US. And we also will look at the EU and US re uh, legislation, including the European Commission uh, regulation on marketing crypto assets, uh, MICA, and the United States Executive Order on uh, um, a responsible development of digital assets, as well as related Canadian law. Um, our conversation partners today are Mark Jones. He's a partner at Stewart's um, Law based in the UK. We have Mark Minor, a senior counsel at Thomson Hein based in the US. We have Marcus um, Kaulartz. He's a partner at CMS based in Europe. And we have Matthew Flynn. He's a partner at Bennett Jones based in Canada. So a very uh, um, interesting and um, a diverse panel and um, in terms of um, where everybody, the, the contribution that everybody is going to make to, um, to this topic. Um, with that, let's dive into the, um, into the conversation. Um, what are digital assets and, um, and what's the underlying technology broadly, Mark, without um, going, Mark Jones, without going too much into the weeds, give right. us a broad overview of what, what we're talking about. Okay, so we're not, we're not gonna do the basics. On, on on what they are and or, or even sort of dive into detail on the, on the technology side. What we're going to be looking at is sort of teasing out some of the commercial issues that arise from the technology. So what we are concerned with, in, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the terminology either, because there's no fixed meaning to lots of these things. We'll be talking about digital assets. So a subset of that would be um, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, that kind of thing. So, and we're looking there at distributed ledger technology. So we're concerned with the implications of that and smart contracts, people using these online um, DLT-based okay, programs for commercial purposes. Um, stable coins might be relevant to this as well. Not so much central bank digital currencies that are just like money. So, and what we're looking at is if there's an increased adoption of this type of, I'll call it an asset class rather than the technology that underpins it, what are the, commercial implications in different areas and I think there's an element where we all I think all of us here on the um on, on this webinar and we've got both I'm just a litigator but we've also got transactional lawyers we know that this is not for all the press coverage commercially it's not as big as other areas but looking forward you want to be prepared for these things and I think we all agree and we'll talk about this that there are areas that you know there are risks that probably already exist in areas that we commercially take for granted, we've not had to think about for so long that we may not even address our minds to it. And actually we need to when businesses start to do these things. And if I just give one final point as to the sort of forward looking thing, point, you never know which direction this, these sorts of new technologies will go or what will increase adoption. And I think people need to sort of step out of their own bubbles Lots of developments in this area have been driven not by what's happened in Western Europe or in North America. They've been driven in other parts of the world. And if I give a very topical example, you know, there's been a lot of focus on sanctions and Russia and how that might push some trade payments and the likes and commerce underground into these types of ways of transacting. What will be the medium term effect of that? Might it be that actually people who are involved in that realize it actually works quite well? And it leads to a broader adoption in other parts of the world. So I throw that out there just as you, you, you never know what it is that's going to stimulate and increase the growth there and in, in what areas. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Marcus, how is that um, in, uh, um, you know, from, from your vantage point? Um, what are some of the, uh, um, you know, basic, um, you know, issues we need to look at commercially when it comes to digital assets? So the most interesting thing about digital assets and being based on blockchain technology or similar technologies is obviously that the first time in history, if you want, um, it, this technology enables you to actually own data and generally speaking, and this data, we call that tokens, coins, cryptocurrencies, whatever, and we can link 
rights claims or whatever to that token um, to that piece of data and therefore we can technically prove ownership of rights and we can at the same time move such data instead of simply copying it this is something new which has not been possible before this blockchain technology came to us and with that we have one big issue from a legal perspective and this big issue is that since we can move data now without any intermediaries we do not have this central point which can be addressed by legislators by regulators etc so what's ever happening on the blockchain nobody can control that because i can just move my tokens and nobody can can forbid me to do that so what's currently happening in german and eu jurisdiction in, in legislation is that we get more and more gatekeepers since we can't regulate the technology as such since we since we can't regulate intermediaries since we can't tell blockchain developers how to uh, develop a blockchain the eu commission decided to uh, to add gatekeepers like for kyc purposes like for um, financial service purposes etc and those are now regulated and the question will always be what's happening if i use a service on the blockchain without such intermediary uh, sorry without such gatekeeper who can forbid me to do that and the, the current answer is actually no but what's currently happening is that due to those kyc and AMA regulations i will soon no longer be able to use online services on the blockchain without being kyc and aml and then i have a strong incentive to go via those regulated gatekeepers Interesting. Uh, Mark Miner, what's the situation in, in, in Canada in that in that context? Uh, Mark wouldn't know about so you go ahead, Mark, in the US. Oh, Mark in the US. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as uh, many folks know, there's so much activity uh, in this space. There's a bit of uh, well, not a bit, there's quite a bit of regulatory uh, arbitrage, I would say. Uh, some are from business standpoints peaking non-us locations um there is uh a, such a, a scrum uh for what the regulatory rules of the road are going to be that you can hardly blame some of the institutions that really are asking for clarity <clears throat> and yet do not have it um yet in recognition of the the markets in march uh of this year uh the us uh, issued an executive order uh to try to address uh writ large the the issues that are uh, created by digital markets largely it's called a whole of government strategy i don't know how you address all factors that digital assets may may cover uh, but essentially there are six topics that the, the president has mandated in the u.s for several agencies to become uh, involved in uh, Consumer protection and investor protection, and that includes uh, some of the the issues of access and transparency. I know we're going to talk a little bit more about financial stability, and we have a financial stability oversight committee uh, that is supposed to develop policy on which types of activities create systemic risk uh, to the market. We have illicit finance, and that is obviously criminal uh, activity. Um, how to make uh, the U.S. a leader? In the, in the global financial uh, system. Uh, there are lots of countries who are some with guardrails and some without uh, developing things very quickly. And the Department of Commerce in the US is interested in keeping pace. Uh, financial inclusion, uh, which is ensuring that all aspects of the market have access to these technologies and digital uh, currencies and transactions where possible and responsible innovation. This is the part that has garnered most of the headlines because it includes the, the impact of digital markets on ESG and the environment and, and climate. Um, and there's an asterisk here in that an, an important part of this study, which will uh, issue its first report in 2025, um, is exploring uh, the creation of 
uh, central bank for digital currency. And there's been lots of discussion in lots of countries that have already uh, issued, uh, China, the Bahamas, uh, and others, who are trying to get ahead of this notion of, uh, as, as Marcus mentioned, the absence of a fiat currency and an ability to track it, to have a state-sponsored uh, analog to that created by the, the central banks. So it's a huge mandate, um, but that's been the, the U.S.'s uh, approach. I should also say that um, the U.S. is really taking um, its lead on the climate issues really from some of the developments of the EU. And so it has been uh, looking largely toward uh, some of the policies that the EU is rolling out to figure out how far it should go uh, in uh, addressing the, the climate impact um, of, of digital assets uh, for the U.S. markets. Interesting. Thank you. Matthew, um, from, from the Canadian viewpoint. Uh, in Canada, you know, I guess to match DeFi or the regulators are also being decentralized. Um, we, it sounds like the European context where uh, what we have is um, a bunch of, uh, you know, regulators of general application looking at these assets rather than um, trying to write um, something that, that like Mark uh, in the US is talking about, like rather than overarching regulation or legislation. Um, at this point, there's been talk. Uh, the central bank here has, has spoken about it. Um, bank of Canada. Uh, so a lot of study groups going on, a lot of looking into what it is. But you know, right now the reality is is that um, it's regulated by securities law. The securities um, uh, regulator here likes to look at it as a security. Looks to look at like a catch and release thing where they'll, they'll watch the market. And if they don't like what's going on, they'll They'll throw a flag, but they haven't um, given clear guidance as to as to what's um, you know allowed and not allowed. Um, whereas the you know our tax authority looks at them not as securities but as commodities, so that they can pick up on the capital gains um, when the when the you know the cryptocurrency or the, or the asset gets bought or sold. They're not looking at it as as legal currency, so they're calling it commodity. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, FinTrack, which is looking at it from AML and, and KYC perspectives, trying to stop, you know, terrorist financing, money laundering, et cetera. So it's very decentralized right now. Um, yeah, the Canadian government would also like to see a, um, you know, state-sponsored cryptocurrency central bank um, and, and one that would presumably give them control over monetary policy. Uh, presumably um, allow them to work in, in conjunction with uh, European and, um, and US and other counterparts in UK. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now. So there's not, there's not a lot of clarity, uh, but an awful lot of uh, interest. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it, you know, not a, um, not a lot of clarity, I guess, is the, is the key, the key uh, um, word here. The, uh, um, I mean, there is a, the way I see it is there is a, um, you know, a, a fight between on one side, um, you know, it, in, if it, we want to keep it decentralized, oh, it's a um, decentralized um, finance movement. But if we bring it back into the, uh, um, you know, under the umbrella of, of um, central banks, then um, that kind of defeats the purpose. But it would offer, um, you know, it, um, a regulatory clarity. Um, how uh, um, what 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 are some of the key um, the key issues? And I want to dive into the regulatory angle, but just a few words from each one of you. Um, and my, maybe Marcus, if you want to start, um, you know, what's what's the what's that um, what's the advantage and what's the disadvantage of um, you know this thing um, decentralized? Well, if you ask the crypto community, then the big advantage of being decentralized is not being centralized, um, meaning that you do not need any intermediaries which um, cost money and uh, which um, obviously are, in their view, old economy um, and perhaps not as quick as um, as they are adapting to new technologies, um, which is at the same time a problem from a legal perspective because you can't, um, to the same extent, uh, protect markets, consumers, etc. Um, on the other hand, what's happening in a decentralized market is that we can make full profit of um, software and we can use 
only software to provide financial services and banking services with those digital assets. And let's recall that we use banks and custodians, etc. Basically, the, the main reason for using them is that we need them technically. So because I, I do not know how much money I have on my bank account if my bank is not confirming that I have $5 on my bank account. But with that new technology, I know exactly how much money I have because I own it, even if it's digital. And this is the big advantage this technology is bringing to us. And it, the next one or two years will, at least in Europe, show how the regulator can cope with those new developments in particular in light of the new MICA regulation coming in force uh, probably end of this year. Mm. And does any of the others want to come and enter this? Mark, you're, Mark Minor, you're nodding. Yeah, I mm. think uh, Marcus raises really the central tension here, which is, and I, I want to uh, honor Mark Jones's admonition to not dive too far into the, the weeds on this, but um, the, the, the blockchain because it creates a ledger that is immutable, does create um, a, a perfect audit trail uh, that can be uh, tested te technologically. And I think a lot um, of uh, institutions are now coming to the realization that that is at least as good, if not superior to other audit trails that the financial markets uh, are using. But it was also designed for its uh, opaqueness uh, if not anonymity. And it, it also, therefore, from a regulatory standpoint, becomes a perfect forum for rogues and vagabonds to do all sorts of interesting things. <clears throat> Netflix in the U.S. right now is exploding in, in interest uh, uh, with, with a documentary um, called Trust No One, uh, which is the story of um, a, a crypto exchange uh, in Canada that ended up being um, investigated by the Ontario Securities Commission. Uh, many people that follow the space know it very well, but it breaks down, uh, it tells the, the story of what happens when um, a institution that has taken in billions of dollars or, or is at least trading billions in crypto uh, goes dark. <clears throat> now, as Matthew mentioned, <clears throat> the worst of those institutions are regulators are, are focusing most of their, their, their fire. Um, and, fo and focusing on the clear frauds first. Um, but even the Securities Commission mentioned how difficult it was to even begin the traditional follow the money and trace the money investigation for institutions who, for whom reporting requirements, at, at least then, um, are absent. We're beginning to see in the US and in some other countries uh, some things that will enable the traditional financial markets and these markets to uh, intersect. And it's also part of the reason why there's no uh, clarity. Everyone wants a stake um, and there's no clear view on which would have supremacy, currency, security, um, uh, et, et cetera. And so that's what the regulators are all grappling with. Hmm. Uh, Matthew, do you want to, uh, Mark, yeah, go for it. I was just gonna, sorry, I was just gonna jump in very quickly. <laughs> sorry, Matthew, and just say, just to, the background is quite important to it. The sort of the history of this sort of asset class is early on. You know, it was basically viewed as a criminal activity. That's and that was that's framed the way the law developed. We had early criminal law stuff, and then the regulators sort of stepping in. And I know that certainly the underlying technology. I think this phrase was applied to that it was a solution in search of a problem. And, mm. and it's only sort of you know those the applications are kind of now being found more in the financial side, I'd say, but increasing on the commercial side. And it's Marcus's point: you get disintermediation. You get transaction efficiency that that comes from it, and then certainly on the commercial side with with the smart contracts, you get this what's its automaticity. So they just execute themselves. You you, you reduce that kind of counterparty risk that someone's not going to perform, and it's those factors that are going to see you know more adoption in the sort of commercial arena, and, and then that's what's going to start giving rise to new the, the new legal problems that we haven't. Um, we had to deal with in the courts, certainly not over here yet. The decisions over here have all been very much driven by fraud actions, not commercial yet. Uh, not yet, not yet. Uh, mm. Matthew, from the um, Can Canadian angle. 
Well, from the Canadian angle, I mean, I think there's there's an appetite here definitely to uh, for innovation um, in this area. Um, as Mark uh, Miner brought up, yeah, there was a uh, Quadriga CX uh, out of Nova Scotia. There was was a crypto trading platform um, run off uh, one encrypted laptop by one person um, who uh, subsequently uh, passed away, and then um, the the 190 million dollars under um, you know that that they had in their wherever they're holding it, you know, uh, was inaccessible. Um, so that that I, that you know the Canadian response to that was well let's let's get harder on uh, crypto trading platforms, um, and you saw the Canadian Securities Administrator, which is the the um, so so in Canada this the securities is run regulation is run at a federal level, but it's also difference between provinces. So the CSA is the sort of the overarching body here. Look at this and then became very um, diligent and vigilant around crypto trading platforms. So that was the response. Uh, there's still a lot of appetite for DeFi here. There's still a, a need for innovation. Um, but again, um, we're not, um, you know, we're just not, the companies just aren't getting the clarity they need uh, to do it. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very small banking uh, financial system up here, six major banks, very command and control bank of Canada. So, you know, um, moving into areas that, you know, allow for data portability, things like open banking, things that would make it, um, that would lessen the friction of intermediaries uh, will necessarily move slowly here because of that. And because Canadians are, you know, cautious, overly cautious. I think what will happen with, as with many things is we'll sit back and, and, and look to see and learn from the U.S., the U.K., and the E.U. as to as to what works and what doesn't, and try to cherry pick from the best of that. But that will mean uh, ultimately that we will be a bit of a, a bit of a laggard in the uh, innovation space. Yeah. So the whole issue: digital assets. Is it an investment um, vehicle, or is it a um, uh, a, uh, um, a commodity? Uh, um, uh, you know, um, that discussion between the E.U. and the U.S. Is that and other um, you know, um, critical aspects. Uh, do you think they're properly addressed in the uh, uh, MICA and in the uh, t um, uh, U.S. regulation? I don't know, um, Marcus. Do you want to do you want to start with that? So it appears to me that <clears throat> the EU regulation um, takes a completely other um, view on on tokens and cryptocurrencies than the U.S. regulation does, in particular because. We do not qualify tokens as securities, only a very rare number of tokens, which actually um, embody claims on for getting dividends or whatever. But most tokens which we have here on the market are qualified as crypto assets. This is the new term in the law. And crypto assets are financial instruments. This is the old term in the law. And then we have multiple um, restrictions and, um, and permission obligations in the law applying to financial instruments and therefore to crypto assets. But the entire securities regulation is, as a rule, not applicable to crypto assets. And this makes things much easier because crypto assets and financial instruments are much less regulated uh, than securities. The MICA, nevertheless, introduces some new obligations which are a bit similar to securities. For example, I need to publish a white paper when I want to sell tokens. This is a bit of comparable to a securities prospectus, but but it's it has um, only a very few pages. It doesn't need to be approved, etc. So <clears throat> this is way less regulated than securities in, in Europe. Mark Miner? Yeah, I, I'd say that uh, uh, the U.S. is still grappling with this uh, question. Um, <clears throat> you have things clearly, uh, I'd say our, our, the U.S. Treasury Department uh, was uh, the first to say something, which is we, we're not sure what it is, but we're going to tax it, <laughs> right? And then um, then the, uh, uh, the Commodities Futures uh, uh, Trading Commission um, really jumped in um, first, uh, to talk about uh, the commodities features. Uh, the U.S. Department of Chamber of Commerce has clearly preferred 
uh, that if there's going to be a characterization that comes under regulation, it will be viewed as a commodity. <clears throat> and then um, the, the SEC came in after that. Um, it has not said uh, that everything is clearly uh, security. Uh, they look first to the method in which it's used. They use the Howey test, which is a U.S. law that will assess um, whether or not someone is investing in something um, on the efforts of others with an expectation of profit. Um, they're obviously leaving open the possibility under this uh, large, you know, whole government analysis that there is some sector uh, where the, as to, to use Marcus's phrase, crypto assets uh, would not fit within uh, that definition. There's also a bit of um, nomenclature uh, that gets muddled in, whether uh, Marcus mentioned tokens, uh, which would be the thing, the digital asset that can be moved, but tokenization, um, whether or not that by definition becomes something that would be regulated um, as a security. So there's lots of players um, at, at the table um, and they are still uh, coming up with what the rulemaking uh, is going to be. The only clear area is that for initial coin offerings, uh, the regulators have been very uh, involved in the U.S., um, but not prohibiting uh, them. They have regarded those um, as activity falling under the securities laws. And clearly, any uh, medium uh, to uh, pass the digital assets back and forth, I'll loosely refer to as an exchange, um, although it falls under uh, different names, um, has been viewed as something that requires uh, securities uh, regulation as a, um, a place where those institutions, those uh, instruments can be purchased and sold. Yeah. Interesting. Let's let's dive um, a little bit deeper into uh, um, into the topic. Uh, Mark Jones, uh, jurisdiction of courts. Um, mm. Who can enforce what and where? Do you want to? It's a good question. <laughs> One of the biggest uh, questions. <laughs> it's certainly, I mean, it's certainly commercially really important question. I mean, one of the takeaways I'd say that anybody doing anything in the area really needs to be hard on is, it, it, you know, governing law and jurisdiction clauses are always important. They've never been more important than if you were dealing with anything um, in this area, because um, if you if you're not, then working out the answer is an absolute um, minefield. It's, you know, it's obviously going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's something that English courts have been very good at grappling with. We've had a handful of cases all in the area of fraud where you invariably don't know who or where the fraudsters are. It's the nature of most of these cases involve Bitcoin. And the courts have taken the decision that the, the location of, in this, in this case of Bitcoin, is the, 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 the place where the, the private key holder is, the original private key holder, the claimant. Um, and that's a very expedient, you know, decision to take. Um, very helpful because it means that if someone's based here and they have their uh, crypto assets stolen, defrauded, then they're not going to have trouble establishing jurisdiction by not being able to identify where the fraudster is. Getting into esoteric arguments about where the where the activity took place, where the individual is, it all makes it very difficult. Um, moving on. If you're in the arena, if you've got a contract, you've got parties using a smart contract, you've not specified jurisdiction, then you're into a whole new world of complexity. You know, it depends on what the tests are that the, the, the court you're in uses. Do they say it's the characteristic performance of the contract? Well, where's that? Um, is, it the, is, is it the location of the contracting parties? Well, what if the contract was actually um, in this sort of DeFi universe who, you know, you tend to have lots of different, you may have custodians, multiple different entities involved, who are the relevant contracting parties? You may not know where they are based in some cases, straightforward, um, some, some, some on-chain transactions. And so, I mean, really what you've got is the old questions of jurisdiction, but they're just supercharged with difficulty. There's actually a, um, a law commission here is first, it's got a, a consultation paper out on smart contracts where it looks at jurisdiction issues. And then I think this summer, well, actually about now, they're starting to consult on private international laws generally in this area, because it's, I think it's regarded pretty much as the most difficult area of dealing with this new asset class and technology, but it's phenomenally important. 
Um, oh. I mean, maybe I'll just I'll give a very quick example as to how you can radically end up with very different answers. Let's take a sale of goods contract. The sale of goods contract uh, in English law, it's got to be a contract for money or money's worth. Um, it's probably the case that if you buy something with a cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin, that is not money, and therefore it's not a sale of good contract. So there's all sorts of issues as protections you lose. But it also means that an English court would characterize that contract differently and would determine there would be different jurisdiction rules. You know, one, if it was sale of goods, I, I, I think, well, I think we're looking at the, um, this might have been the EU rule, I think we're looking at the habitual residence of the seller. Now, it's very different potentially from the place of performance of the contract. So yeah. depending on how you characterize the contract, you could end up with very different jurisdictions and governing laws. Now that's, if you've not chosen them, that could be critically important. Fascinating. What I mean by the type of basic issue yeah, that we, you take for granted and we, you need to think again about it very carefully. Mark, Minor? You know, you raise an interesting question. Uh, um, uh, most regulators, at least in the US, when you talk to them about these issues of jurisdiction, will start from the premise that um, the questions about the thing uh, being regulated are clear. And so the fact that we are now using these technological innovations uh, to perform them, they say, doesn't really change their fundamental um, analysis, um, including the country in which uh, the, the the parties are. I mean, you could contract uh, two parties uh, in in Europe and America, and they say they're going to be bound by a particular law. <clears throat> the new premise here is that there are many who are participating in this disruptive technology who are rejecting the notion that the thing that the regulator wants to regulate is going to be regulated. So this this notion here about you know um, the thing has to be money. You know, so someone can say, even in a commercial context, that we are going to apply the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, does the Uniform Commercial Code um, apply, you know, to this particular transaction? There's really nothing new about a transaction that is trying to take advantage of havens or jurisdictions where there are tax ad ad advantageous um, implications of, of the transaction. Um, but what is new here is entrants into the marketplace who are rejecting the regulatory authority over the thing itself. Yeah, but can that be solved by me just assigning a jurisdiction? If I say, um, you know, the law that governs this contract is, uh, you know, um, British law, um, it, it, can I make that the case to, to make this more, more transparent, more easy to, 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 to govern? Absolutely, but Mark's hit on a really important point that culture in this area, and, and Marcus has talked about it too, one, one of the sort of philosophies behind this technology is you don't want to be um, caught, you want to escape regulation, you want to escape national boundaries, and that includes escaping national law. I could point you to two dozen websites out there with commercial operations, sort of in the DeFi arena, you will find nothing on there in terms of legals about jurisdiction, the end, what the entity is or governing law and that's quite deliberate because the, there's a I hesitate to call it a movement but there's a there's a you know a school of thought out there that says it's the code that's the law mm. they literally on the platform the platform's protocol is the law for the people involved with it and that's that now that's not true well I don't I'm, I, I'm my position is not true the law in England the Rome Convention is very clear you have to choose a law and software code is not a law but there are you know part people that there's, there's disagreement in that area and it probably may well differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction there's a very live issue and it's this is why it's people are choosing deliberately not to specify governing law and jurisdiction and that's going to give rise to if that takes on you know in any in any commercial area that's that's very risky yeah, I mean, it's like you can only really do business when there is a um, in a um, in an environment um, where where you have laws, because if you don't have a um, you know a legal environment, um, you know anything is a free for all. But we have one question from the from the audience. 
Um, isn't one of the confusions the fact that owners of tokens believe that they own a piece of the technology, which isn't the case? Marcus, is that is that um, one of the one of the issues? Um, so owning a piece of a technology, um, I'm not sure if I have ever heard somebody saying that. Um, I mean, if you if you understand technology as as what as IP or as know-how or um, as being part of it, meaning that technology doesn't work anymore without me. Um, Maybe the code. The 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 thing is that <clears throat> we we can't we, we got a new law in Germany, for example, a few weeks ago, which says that um, I can actually link a claim to a token, meaning that whoever is the owner of the token is automatically also the owner of a certain claim. Liechtenstein, for example, had this law two years, <clears throat> two years earlier, and this is very interesting because it makes you it makes you see claims because you, currently today we, we can't we can't really see who has a claim against against whom because it's it's a, a virtual thing to have having a claim against somebody. But when I now link a claim to a token, then I actually see who is the owner of that claim because I can see who is the owner of the token. Perhaps this is the the link between owning something. Interesting. Um, Matthew, um, any any comments from 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 Canada? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the way that this would probably be looked at in Canada is um, so I'm not a litigator by trade. I'm a, uh, a commercial lawyer. Um, you know, if you have a if you have an agreement that specifies a particular jurisdiction um, and it's entered into by two you know quote sophisticated parties, I'm sure that the courts here would would honor that. I think if you move into the area where uh, one side is, for example, crypto trading platform, the other side is uh, you know Joe Canadian individual who uh, starts to fall under consumer uh, protection. Um, even if there was a stated jurisdiction for the agreement, I wonder if the courts would look at that and say, well, that's nice, but Joe Canadian has no idea what that's about. So even though your your agreement says uh, Liechtenstein is, uh, is its governing law, that's not that's not what's happening here. Um, so I think I think you know we got to take that into consideration. I'm sure all will be revealed at some point. Um, but I do note also, and this is just a, a side note is that you know for example on you know software agreements so in particular you know you will always see not always but often see language that disclaims um, the sales of goods legislation of the un convention etc so you know I and mean, so the software companies have already been trying to get away from from that um for, for a while now but i think i think this new drive into crypto will will definitely um as mark jones was saying uh, to try to drive people further away from an overarching regulatory framework. Um, so just, just a thought. Yeah, interesting. I, so we talked about transaction documentation and anonymy um, and in, anonymity um, issues. Um, consumer and investor protection. How about um, the safety in commercial transactions? Um, do, do we want to um, um, get a little bit more? Because we said we would be doing some issue spotting. Um, Mark, do you have any any comments, Mark Jones? Um, on the the, the the safety in terms of like the the I mean blockchains, any DLT transaction much vaunted as being far more secure. Mm. Yeah. Well. I mean, True blockchain, yeah, it is. Um, I mean, what I see a lot of is that in terms of where there is fraud or where things do go wrong, it's not because of the underlying DLT. Um, it's the APIs, it's the apps that people use, it's a hot wallet in that area. Um, one thing I think it is inter interesting is if businesses do use uh, sort of distributed ledger technology, if they're relying on a third party and that's certainly another area that I think is going to be really hot because I mean increasingly I think what we're going to see using we're certainly seeing it with, with crypto exchanges as sort of early adopters of this model but you're getting these outfits called de you know decentralized autonomous organizations um, yeah, which is claims to be a non-corporate non 
legal entity that engages in commercial activity. Um, people benefit it from financially, but they're not shareholders. They don't hold securities. They don't really control it to a greater or lesser degree, but ideally to a lesser stroke, non-existent degree. Um, what if something goes wrong there? You I mean this is slightly this is slightly blue sky forward looking, but it, there are real examples. A, a, an exchange in the US last year, Shapeshift, the its corporate. I don't know whether it's gone fully decentralized yet, but its founder said he would within 12 months make it totally decentralized. You're transacting with that entity, and I appreciate this is just crypto exchanges, but let's just push it forward. There will be commercial applications. You, know, you can see in the financial arena there could very well be. Who or who or what are you contracting with? Mm -hmm. And what if something goes wrong? And how do you correct it? Mm. If it's the, the DLT, the idea that there aren't going to be errors in the software, um, is it the developers? Mm -hmm. No, they will say it's nothing to do with us. We just put it up there on a platform. People can use it if they want to or not, but we're not running it. We might benefit from some tokens, but we're not responsible. We don't maintain it. We disclaimed everything. And that, that's what I say. There's this sort of open field of, what's then the governing law which court can hear it and how do you how do you even get a result if you can't change the the let's go the, the, the blockchain if you can't change things on there without that whole community voting in majority or whatever protocol set up voting to change it so the the the, the, the ability of any legal of any court to give a rem, give effect to its remedies is also another big issue in this area once you start to use this technology so on the one hand, yeah, great when it works, super secure, great for certain types of functions, but as and when it goes wrong and things will, you know, <laughs> you, you, it's gonna raise some really very difficult questions for, for courts around, you know, in, in New York and in Frankfurt and Paris and London and all over. Mm. Yes, it seems like everybody has ownership, but nobody has the responsibility that that brings um, with yes. it. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, do you wanna comment on that? I would add that, um, you know, this entire discussion about Web3 and um, the metaverse, etc. And <clears throat> since this is also like a decentralized um, application, um, where which which is operated outside of the financial sector, where I can, which I can enter, I can buy football tickets, I can watch a video, I can buy, uh, I can buy uh, images, whatever. So this is something similar to video games which will enter or might enter our daily <clears throat> daily private life and where i can conclude ordinary contracts like or a purchase for a certain virtual good or whatever so um I what, what, I, what i want to say is this will become much more important and attract much more people than only in the financial sector all the consumers will be will have issues when buying online a virtual asset from somebody somebody they do not know at all and they even do not know their name or whatever so what you certainly need is some kind of a a um, regulatory framework for civil law purposes which gives us or the consumers acting on DeFi on web3 in the metaverse or whatever which gives us some safety on what legal regime applies and i'm well aware that there is um there is always laws which will supersede contracts because they protect consumers for example but nevertheless this would be a very first step to protect participants in those new webs um, and it's still better than the current situation in which uh, we do not know what law applies, and if you give that case to, to a judge here in Munich, I'm sure he will not decide on it because he just that doesn't know what to do. If you have two anonymous parties and you do not know where they live and what laws might be applicable, this is certainly a big challenge we have. And therefore, I'm just um, just working in, in a Web3 Act committee, which is trying to develop something like that, which could be used then in certain Web3 applications. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's back to to what we what we said um, earlier. It's really, um, you know, you need to um, a create um, some sense of safety, aka laws, regulation, to make this a level playing field. 
but also to make it a viable um, business environment because there is no viable business environment with total um, you know t um, darkness and 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 uh, anonymity nobody knows who's who and everybody has their hands in something I mean it's um, what are the remedies now if something goes wrong are there any remedies are um, wh where are we on this well I think that there are traditional remedies <clears throat> that one uh, can apply you know I'm I, I might disagree here that in order for an industry to survive um, it needs the imprimatur of, of, of safety I think US markets and its regulators um, have been uh, caught on their heels and really surprised at how wide the adoption of these of these practices and markets are without any real uh, protection. And Marcus raises a good point. You you might never go um, even on a a, a standard uh, platform to buy something on uh, Amazon or eBay with no uh, belief that if it's not sent that there's any recourse and yet that is what is happening every day um, in, in in these markets um, if there's an institution um, you know one can sue uh, the institution or, or the platform um, but there are no uh, institutional or systemic guide rails there's no FDIC insurance like a banking institution would have there's no CIPIC insurance for the uh, investment, I think it's partly why U.S. regulators right now, until they get things all sorted out, are saying um, if a person pays a thing of value for something uh, else, we're going to call that person a consumer until someone says that this law doesn't apply. And if you are uh, purchasing something paying something of value with an expectation that that thing is going to grow in value, it's likely to be a security. We're going to treat it that way in, in rough justice. The size of the activity in the market has been so large, most regulators, at least in the U.S., are just starting with the ones that are clearly fraud and mm. working their way back as they're developing um, other uh, things. Um, and what is the recourse? The recourse right now is against the platform or the institution that has allowed the transaction because the opportunity to find the individual or the institution on the other side is just fraught uh, with all sorts of issues or problem. Mark Jones raises an, an issue about the developers too. We've now started to see in the US uh, raising questions about whether or not developers themselves need to be registered. If you were going to build a thing uh, that is going to transact securities or advise uh, or make recommendations, uh, does that developer itself need to be registered as a broker dealer or an investment advisor? This is not, you know another level um, of what is happening uh, in this space. I know it sounds a little like you know the machines are are, are taking over um, and they are doing the transacting. You know maybe we need developers to come up with a, a, a regulatory. Uh, uh, technology and the and the machine will will police the machines. Yeah, I mean, it, I I am um, I'm not sure I um, agree with the sentiment that um, it, it's the same as buying something on Amazon because when I buy something on Amazon, there is a recourse. I mean, and and the last recourse may be, or I mean, that's the first recourse that I take. I pay with my American Express card, and then if I don't get the product delivered to me, I tell American Express, sorry, this wasn't delivered, and they um, re um, retract the payment. So I mean, there is, um, you know, and there's recourse with the platform. I can take the, um, you know, I can uh, tell Amazon that there's a problem with the product. They um, send me a refund. I mean that's not the case with um, with um, in that um, with digital assets, from what I'm understanding, because I don't know who the other guy is, and nobody is. I mean the payment is the asset, so uh, um, what's? Um... But we're going to see. We're just going to see a very broad spectrum of commercial activity from standard. You we talk about traditional finance. You can talk about traditional trade or commerce where this type of technology has some sort of application in the arena but it's not the it's not the medium in which they are transacting still real world entities you know using blockchain as some form of 
uh, register of transactions. I know it's used to a degree in international trade, you know, getting rid of the paper documentation, right? It decreases fraud, it's quicker, more efficient. Uptake's not been huge, apparently, from what I've seen, but the, the potential is there. At the other extreme, you've got Marcus's really important point, and this is the, this is the imagination point about the metaverse, and it means different things to different people, but there are some very big companies staking an awful lot on the view that a lot of people out there in the world are going to be happy to spend more of their uh, working and working life and their leisure time in this digital space uh, and they'll be more going on in that in that digital space which doesn't have any physical representation in this world at all and this is where you can move into nfts and buying clothes for your avatar and all this crazy stuff that sounds why does that matter? How is that relevant? But the point is these things do creep up and they develop and they have commercial applications and people attach value to them. And these these problems will arise. And even, I mean, the UK is looking forward. There's um, There's been a task force that's even proposed some draft sort of arbitration rules that can be, it would be sort of best practice and where you'd, you'd adopt them. Um, and one of the things they contemplate is you want these things, you say you've got distributed lecture technology, there's a problem, you've appointed an expert, it's dealt with in a matter of days. And one of the things that can be given is that you've in advance given that expert, from a well-known respected institution, you've given the expert in advance a private key that en enables that arbitrator, the adjudicator, to alter the blockchain. So coming back to your remedies, that's that's built in. Mm. You know, now, so you can incorporate those into a contract. So that's one way in which it can be done to safeguard, and it might be that commercial outfits that want to use that technology and want the security of knowing that they're not just going to have to rely on a court telling someone to do something who may not do it, but that actually the, the court or adjudicate themselves can affect that remedy. It's very practical, but it needs, you know, the parties need to agree to to do that. But you know, we just it's just as this is the forward looking point. It's um yeah. sorry I'm raising more problems and questions than answers, but it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, what, what's your thinking on, um, you know, looking ahead? So how, um, you know, can can digital currencies ever be the ultimate medium of exchange? Right. Well, just quick on the safety point, I, I guess it is stay out of the dark alleys of the metaverse. Um, sort of <laughs> know, know, know who you're talking to. Uh, common sense. I mean, that's, that's always it's the same with uh, transacting with other commercial people. You got to know who you're, who you're dealing with. Going forward, um, I think, listen, I, I think the genie's out of the bottle. This is going to be part of the broader economy somehow. Um, I don't know that uh, the central banking system in the world, um, which is so globalized and tied in to each other, um, would or could allow for it to just run rampant. I mean, you look what happened in 2008 uh, and all these international governments working together because the contagion had spread all over the world. Um, you know, and so as much as there are naysayers about central banks and regulation, you, you do need it. Um, I, I can't imagine uh, what would have happened if a lot of that was in crypto and the governments had no control over, um, you know, what, what was happening in the broader market. It will be a part of it. It's just, uh, will it become the main central way of commerce? Um, I don't think it will. I think we're going to have to find ourselves in a, in a world where um, it exists, it, it cohabitates with, uh, with fiat. Um, I don't know, any, any thoughts from the Marks out there? Marks and Marcus? <laughs> I'd say that the genie is, uh, is definitely out of the bottle and mm -hmm. there will be a, I don't know, a way to peacefully uh, coexist, but uh, it's definitely here to stay. We're certain to see uh, further developments in the marketplace uh, Mark talked. Mark Jones talked a little bit about uh, smart contracts. I certainly we're certainly going to see a much huger adoption of of those. And while we are figuring this out, or maybe permanently, uh, we're starting to see the emergence of an an, an insurance class uh, that is developing in this area. That I think institutions are going to have to uh, grapple with. We have several clients here at the firm who are beginning to see in the RFPs and the due diligence whether or not they have uh, improper proper insurance coverage. I spoke to the chief risk officer of probably the, one of the largest uh, crypto uh, exchanges right now in, in the world who talks about the two ways that they monitor risk are traditional markets, hedging, um, and insurance. 
um, and yet there are very few insurers who are willing to take this risk on, um, and so their premiums are, are, are expensive. Um, there's been a 70% increase in the market activity in the crypto exchanges space over last year, and yet very few insurers have entered this space. Uh, so they're looking for great, I think Woods of London now has entered the space, um, but institutions are gonna have to be thinking about whether or not their insurance coverage is covering both storage um, uh, of digital assets and what happens in the event of intrusion or hot wallets or while transactions are taking place. And I think that's, while we're figuring that out, I think that's gonna be um, a huge part of market change. Yeah, we haven't talked about that, but um, cyber attacks um, play definitely play a role here. Um, you know, you can set. Um, I mean, it's like I'm I'm all for the metaverse, and I have friends who want to move um, there um, very soon, as soon as possible. <laughs> but um, you know, what what about cyber attacks? I mean, we talked about the the war in Ukraine. Um, how safe is that is that platform? Um, you know, going to be at the end of the day. But um, Marcus, I think, um, you know, do, do you want to have the um, a final comment on looking in, into the future? Uh, yeah, just one word on, on cyber security. I mean, to the extent um, we look at blockchain and private keys and tokens, et cetera, I think this is very safe because it's based on math, on, on mathematics. And, uh, and I haven't seen any hacks of blockchain of blockchains up to now. What we have seen is hacks of custodians. And this is one reason why um, the EU, for example, will regulate, or what partly does already regulate custodians and requires them to comply with huge IT requirements, uh, just to be sure that private keys can't be stolen. Um, for your second question, um, I am very much convinced that this technology is here uh, to stay. And let's not link uh, blockchain too much to cryptocurrency and this crazy market, which is uh, running up and down every day, um, in particular down currently. Um, but let's see the, the 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 value we get from it. Um, Web3, the, the idea of having, of owning assets in a virtual world doesn't have to do anything with cryptocurrencies. But this is something, this is a gap we had so far in IT, which has been closed by this, this, this technology. And I'm sure that the legal issues we have right now, I'm sure that the lawyers and legislators will solve those. And um, this might take a couple of years, mm -hmm. but I'm sure we get a good solution. Good. Mark Jones, last word. I'm just going to pick up with what Matthew said about central bank digital currencies. If they are adopted, if they're promoted, I mean, that's that that must increase the uptake and use of smart contracts commercially. Because the, the whole the benefit you've got there is you're getting rid of the payment system, the costs involved in the banking payment system. And just to put this in perspective, I looked recently, I think the figures for 2019 or 2020 was that globally, the big banks, their revenue, 15% of it comes from plain vanilla business to consumer or business to business transfers. It's a huge amount, tens and tens of billions, probably hundreds of billions a year. Um, that's huge savings for business. You know, if you can use a central bank digital currency, you get rid of the bank, you use a smart contract, payments are made automatically. Why aren't businesses going to do that to a greater degree? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is um, to be continued um, without a question. But I, um, I think we raised some really interesting, um, at, um, you know, issues around digital assets, and um, we will see, um, you know, how they how they develop. And um, thank you to to our panel for 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 joining us today. We uh, um, we do have um, a digital um, a digitalization initiative. So there will be uh, um, a thought leadership articles coming out on this topic, and which will include our panelists and other EICC members. And um, with that, um, we conclude today's webinar. And um, a quick reminder, if you're a member of the EICC, we can connect, we're happy to connect you uh, um, with other attendees of the program. And um, just email us to, to let us know whom you want to connect with. Uh, we're trying to make them the webinars as close to our live events as possible. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.